We have been looking at uh, physiological monitoring to try to infer how hard people are working on a given task. What we've been trying to do is uh, find the least intrusive means for collecting physiological data. We were looking at the aviation domain, uh, but it can obviously be extended to a lot of other, a lot of other areas. So initially we had a lab study which looked at a very simple computer task where people were tracking balls and shooting them and we could quite easily vary the demand by increasing and decreasing the number of balls in a given pattern and then we could see if the physiological measures reflected that, that pattern and correlated well with it. So um, that was a lab study to see how feasible this is. And then we went on to doing a helicopter simulator study. One of the questions that we had was, would highly trained individuals and helicopter pilots react in much the same way as an usual person does, you know, to increase level of demand. We did a computer file on something that sounds similar where Horia was using a brain scanner and turning lights red when people were practicing things like air traffic control. Is this a similar kind of idea? Yes, the idea behind it is basically the same. The Efner sensor Horia was using is uh, maybe more accurate in certain scenarios and reflects more of the brain activity. Uh, we're aiming to use thermal imaging as a way to make it less intrusive so people don't have to wear any sort of equipment. So this is a small FLIR thermal camera. The resolution is quite small, it's 640 by 480, so it's not an amazing resolution. There are higher resolution cameras nowadays, but still not up to the level of phone camera. What it does, it's picking up thermal radiation. This should be within the range of 7.5 to I think 13 micrometers and it's converting it to temperature. So obviously that's one step of the way. The other, the, the next step was extracting temperature from various areas of the face. I'm hiding behind the camera here. Yes. This is the scale here on the right. Uh, blue is cold, black is even colder. And then as you go towards red, yellow and white, uh, that symbolizes uh, higher, higher temperature. Yeah. Uh, when we extracted the, the data, we used these sort of images to find facial features. Those facial features allowed us to get data from various areas. We covered quite a large area of the face, whereas previous study looked at smaller areas like the nose, forehead, and indeed, actually, it, mo most of the changes occur there on, on the nose and around the no nose area. People have reported it before. Uh, we try to do a um, more structured study where we could control the demand in a more accurate way. So what we've seen that usually in most people, but not in all of them, nose temperatures tend to drop when they are engaged in a high demand task. And actually they do tend to go back up as the task demand diminishes. The nose tip is the most evident point, but also the side areas of the nose show a similar response, just not as large. Here in gray, you can see the perceived demand. So there are three levels of the task. Towards the mid of each of the levels, the demand peaks. So things highest. get more difficult. Yeah, things get more difficult. And at the same time, you can see here in green, for example, which is temperature in point P, which was the tip of the nose. You can see how that drops. And then as the task becomes easier again, it starts going back up. This year in blue is point V, which was right below the nose. So here you can see also a drop, maybe it's not as high, but still you can see sort of the same pattern. We got a similar pattern in most people and in a lot of the helicopter pilots. Some other people do have naturally colder noses. They're just cold by default, so then there won't be any 
meaningful drop in temperature. Uh, that's yeah one of the one of the other effects. But yeah, we're still exploring to see if for those cases there are other signs indicating to the increase in demand. Is this something that you can do in real time, or how does it work? Uh, we can we can actually do it in almost real time uh, with the algorithm I used, which I have to admit is not highly optimized, but you could do it maybe one frame per second. The camera itself does not output a very high frame rate. It's around 7.5 frames per second. It's actually limited. Uh, you cannot buy it at higher frame rates. Um, and yeah, then the videos are quite large because it's the data is not compressed as you would get in a normal visual video. So it could end up being within the range of 30 GB for, for, for one of the videos. And then, yeah, there's, it's quite a lot of data to, to process. Initially, the video is outputted in a digital level that the camera records which is then converted to actual temperatures by using a calibration curve. And then uh, we used that temperature, basically matrix, to convert it to a visual RGB using a color map, which obviously you can change. The format coming out of the camera is, is digital, so it's, it's the temperatures and then you convert that to video. Do you ever go back from the video, the visual video, back to the original to get the temperatures? Uh, yes, yes, I, I do that at the end. So once you get an area of interest and you need to extract data from it, then you go to the original matrix of temperatures and you get the temperature area from that in between those specific coordinates. We're used to seeing a pixel as being three or four numbers, yeah. RGB, alpha, whatever. So instead of having that, you've got a temperature in Kelvin yeah. or something. Yeah, you, you just have a temperature. Well, I used to convert it in Celsius, but uh, yeah, you can convert it in any unit. Based on that color map, we did the tracking of features. We had various approaches to it. Uh, the first approach from the paper that was published uh, relied uh, on cascade classifiers to detect the eye area. So it was trained to, to pick up eye patterns and to find the eyes. And then we would rely on another property of the thermal image. The pupils are colder than the surrounding. So if you look at this rectangle, which is zoomed in here, this is in actual thermal data. So whereas here you see the RGB picture, the height of this represents temperature. So you could see here how temperature drops across the pupil. So this is basically the center of the pupil. The low temperature there is most likely because there's no blood vessels passing through the pupil. Then you could quite accurately find the center of the pupil. And then going from there, we found the rest of the landmarks. For the helicopter study using uh, this smaller camera, we used a different approach, which actually didn't belong to us. We retrained an algorithm that was uh, previously published. Uh, and it's more robust to posture changes and it works better and faster. We retrained the algorithm to pick up these specific points on the, on the face. It does fail at points in extreme angles, but then we filtered out those intervals. As you can see, as we go through the video, uh, the nose gets colder. Uh, this pilot was going through a very, very difficult scenario where he uh, was performing an auto-rotation, which means that he had no more engine power and he was just going down and trying to cushion the landing just by using the propellers that were not spinning at the moment. Here, as you can see, they crashed and you can see the nose being really, really cold. He looked like he laughed then. <laughs> yeah, he laughed, yeah. <laughs> well, luckily it was a simulator. You yeah, can, yeah. We can laugh after it. <laughs> can you remind me what Pythagoras theorem is? Um, it's to do with triangles. <laughs> The lights are about five seconds behind what um, Max is going through. This much it takes from the heart 
to pump up well, the blood general, to the brain. In uh, general, 32 bit images, that is um, four channels per pixel, um, is very common, even when we're not using.